Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Full of joy to worship with you all again after my vacation where God was so merciful to me. I wanted to be refreshed from a hard season in ministry, and He did more than I could have hoped or asked, and He did more, and I just thank you for your prayers, faithful, loving prayers. Well, since we finished up Romans right before I left... Uh, some of you are actually mad at me, and I, there's only 16 chapters. I don't know what you want me to do. There's not a Romans 17. <laughs> so what I wanted to do for the next two weeks is try to share with you what the Spirit taught me on my trip, which is really the culmination of 36 years of journeying with Christ. Little beams of light have been breaking in throughout my Christian journey, and on this trip, really the glory of the noonday sun broke forth in my heart. And so my calling for the next two weeks is to try to share it with you. So if you'll turn to John chapter 15 is where I'm going to open it up. And I just feel a dependency upon the Spirit to do what I can't do to shine the glory upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me read our passage and we'll go before him in prayer. Jesus, on the night in which he would be betrayed in the upper room, in verse 1, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that he may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Let's go to our God together. Father, we come confidently and boldly because of Jesus Christ to your throne. Lord, we cannot understand what it means to abide in a vine apart from your Holy Spirit and your word. And so I pray this morning that you would help every soul in this room understand the beauty and the fullness of what Christ was declaring to his apostles. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would declare it to every heart in this room. That every one of us would learn this beautiful blessing of abiding in Christ. Meet us, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Whenever I'm struggling, I learned from Spurgeon many years ago to go to Jesus. I read his sermon on coming to him as to a living stone, and we just keep coming again and again and again as believers to Christ. And when I go back to the Word of God, I, I love to go back to the Gospel of John because it just, he, he writes these things so that you might believe in his name. And so John has always just fed me. And to any men or women, who can help me see something beautiful that they saw from the Word of God of Jesus. And so I love reading biographies of those who saw Jesus in a deep and meaningful and transforming way. And for me, as many of you know, it's Hudson Taylor, who was a missionary to China in the 1800s. It's why I named my son Taylor. The book is called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. I encourage you to get a hold of it. That book is really what sent me off to seminary as I was reading it. My heart was just so overwhelmed by what I saw and the glory that it just uh, set a trajectory that I wanted to give my life to proclaim this gospel. Two times throughout my ministry, his spiritual secret has given life to my dry bones, and he's been used of God to help me so much. I would call him a spiritual mentor for sure. Though he's dead, he still speaks. And so I went back thinking maybe some encouragement, but I, I felt like maybe I had drained most of the truth that I could get 
from this book, um, but God. Everything that I've learned in the last 36 years just kind of all broke open uh, in New Zealand. This dense man, I feel like I got it. Just pure mercy that God showed it to me. And I've been drinking from it the last five weeks, and it's doing mighty things. And it's so transforming that I want it for every soul here this morning. And I've been praying for you that God would do that. So come worship with me this morning, Southside. And let's pray and commune and interact with Jesus as we go through this text because he is with us. His lampstand is shining. And so I want us to commune with the living Christ as we worship him in this word. So what I would like to do is just go through the passage not exhaustively, as if anyone could, but I want to set the context so that we can make this massive application into our lives. And so here is my great desire, and clearly the Lord's, is for everybody in this room or live streaming that you would know what it means to abide in Jesus Christ, to see this vine in all of its fullness, that is the Christian life, and to see my little branches filled with his life, How do I get the fullness of Christ into my branches so that it bears the fruit that I've been longing for my whole life since being redeemed? I see fruit here and there, but not like what happened with Hudson Taylor in this book. And through this humble man who who learned this truth, and I would say it's not a secret, it's revealed on every page of Scripture, and millions of Chinese were brought to Jesus Christ through his witness of the gospel. And so I want you to hear from his own mouth what overwhelmed me. He said, I felt the ingratitude, the danger, the sin of not living nearer to God. I prayed, I agonized, I fasted, I strove, I made resolutions, I read the word of God more diligently. I sought more time for meditation. And this is all why he's on the mission field in China. But all without avail. Every day, almost every hour, the consciousness of sin oppressed me. It's weighing on me. It's a weight. I knew that if only I could abide in Christ, all would be well. But I could not. I would begin the day with prayer determined not to take my eye off him for a moment. But the pressure of duties, sometimes very trying on the mission field, and constant interruptions apt to be so wearying that they caused me to forget him. That brought sin, (laughs) and he concluded that each day brought its register of sin and failure of lack of power. To will was present in me, but how to perform it I found not. And so he asked the question, is there no rescue? Must it be this to the end, Um, so much defeat? And I watched a man who God revealed the answer to this longing heart. And I know some of you have that same longing as you sit here this morning. And as I read that, you're like, that's my testimony. There's a way to get real, luscious, vibrant fruit that is abundant so that the Father is glorified. And he found it. And I'm going to share more with you at the end of the sermon of what he found. But what he discovered is what I'm after this morning. This is what I've been praying for you for a month And if I abide in him and his word, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Next week, we'll take that up. And may it be done in our midst this morning. And I just trust his promise to do that in all of us. So one thought as we begin, if you look at John 15, look with me in verse (coughs) 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that he might bear fruit more fruit. Look with me in verse 4. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And then again in verse 8. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. And so what Jesus and the Father and the Spirit are after is fruit-bearing in the children of God. 
so that he gets the glory. And in Sunday school, we spent seven weeks looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And this morning, I, I guarantee you, everyone who taught said this, but here's where you get the fruit of the Spirit. And quite simply, the passage is going to tell us, how do I get that kind of fruit in my life? And the one is to abide in Christ, to abide in his word, to pray, and in verses 9 through 11, to abide in his love. And from this fruit, beautiful God-honoring and God-giving fruit, what every one of you are wanting and desiring in your life is what he says will come. So let's go together and journey with me now in John 15, verse 1. And I could probably preach 10 sermons on verse 1. Um, let's just look at it. Ego a me goes all the way back when Moses says, God, you know, who are you? And he says, I am uh, the, the, the present one, the eternal one, the self-existent one. Everyone knew that that was Yahweh. And Jesus says, ego a me, I am. In the beginning, this book started was the Word, and the Word was, was, was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus Christ is, is God. He's the infinite one. And he says, I am the true vine. He alone is where life and godliness will ever flow from. It's going to come from Christ. All the way back, those who loved Romans, Romans 7, 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, and that's vine and branch, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. You died to the law, you've been joined to Jesus in this union, and what's going to come out of this marriage is fruit bearing. Fruit can come from nowhere else. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so every believer is going to be led to this place where you learn, I can't bear fruit from me. I, I just, God is teaching me I can't do nothing. Apart from him, I can do zero. And he'll keep teaching you that again and again. Until God teaches you that, you will try to abide in you. You'll try to abide in you. My power, my strength. How do I control what's going on in my life? Everything will be you trying to control everything and do it. You will abide in you. Fruit will never come. Until this is bedrock in your soul. Apart from him, I could do nothing. Anyone I've met or read about that has born beautiful fruit for God has been fully convinced of this, usually again and again and again, where you just sit here. That's my testimony. Apart from you, I can do nothing. You can't abide until you get to that place. I can do nothing. So what jumped out at me is how many of us are seeking untrue vines. Because he says, I'm the true vine. And you're abiding in other vines. And I've seen it as your, your, your vine is approval. And so I abide and all I want out of life is to be approved. And I, that's all I live for. That, that is what is my lifeline. It's even why you come to church. And what comes from this fruit is discouragement, Weariness from all the effort, loneliness, man-pleasing, spending money to be relevant, locked into social media. This is the wrong vine. Others, it's, your, your vine is God's approval. And you're spending all your days doing works and works and works so that God will finally approve you. And it's destroying your soul. It's destroying your life. You're weary and heavy laden because you're trying to get God's approval through your own works and your own effort. I've talked to some where your vine is, I just want my husband's acceptance and love. And no matter how hard you've labored to serve and help and love him, you sit here this morning unloved. And that vine has not borne the fruit that you want. I've seen some where your vine is your children's success and it's just a ball and chain around your heart. You can only be as happy as your child is happy, and, and it's killing you to make your little, I don't even want to make up a name because it might be someone's Barnabas. <laughs> there's, there's no Barnabases in this church. There should be. You're wasting a great name. But all I want is for Barnabas to be happy and to know Jesus, and, and it, I can't sleep at night, and it just owns me, and that's your vine. And it's not bearing fruit, it's bearing bad fruit. 
your boss. I work day and night. I abandon my family so I can just get praise and honor at the yearly banquet. My body is my vine, and, and I just all I can think about is how to get it healthy, how to get it in shape and make it beautiful. And it's just, it just owns you 24-7, and it, it's killing your life. Ministry, work and work in the church and labor to fatigue and the fruit of joy and peace are not on the branches. Maybe getting married is your vine and it's just consuming. And so what I want to tell you this morning, what I've learned, is if you do not abide in the true vine, you will not bear fruit. Those other vines will not bear good fruit. Do you see what Jesus is offering to us? The vine here is Christ. And Christianity is about how to be joined to this vine in a living, vital, organic way. A true vine and a true branch, I want you to hear this, is the design of God. This is Christianity. This is what happens when we come to Christ. And so what I want you to understand as we move through this passage is this must mean communion with Christ. Okay? So to, to abide, he's going to tell you in verse 3, you're already saved. So this is the believer's offer. And so you already are in union with Christ. So what we're learning here is abiding then has to be how to have communion with Christ as a believer. Abide with him and you'll bear much fruit. This is the believer who at conversion exercises his God-given faith and he's joined to Jesus Christ, the branch, in this inseparable union. And I love how John says it, I and him and he and me. How do you describe oneness anymore? I and him and he and me. That's the gospel. We, we don't labor and work to get ourselves into the vine. Some of you are trying to get yourself in the vine through self-effort. We are grafted into this vine when we believe in Christ. You are put in a vital union, a marriage, one flesh, one body. Such beautiful metaphors. If someone asked me, Ken, what's your greatest and most influential thing about you? Well, it's quite simple. I'm one with Jesus Christ by his doing. Every believer, believer no, no matter how great or small your faith, you're joined to Jesus Christ. You're attached to a vine by grace through faith. You're in the deepest possible relationship that you could have with Jesus Christ. And many don't believe that because of my sin, what I don't do, all these reasons. Believe the gospel and the true vine, it's yours. And Jesus says, I am the true vine. And then I want you to look at the second part. And my father is the vine dresser. Again, a whole sermon. I just want you to hear this. You have a true vine, and you have a father named Abba, who takes care of the branches so that I will bear much fruit. So this fruit-bearing God has given you everything you need. Jesus Christ is a vine, and the father is a vine dresser. So look at verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away... And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. And so what this is saying is God is going to prune my life with trials and difficulties, hardships, and he's going to do it in perfect wisdom and in perfect love. And I just look at all those rose bushes in the spring when they're all cut back and pruned and they, it looked like the gardener killed them. Every time, every year, I look at it and just say, that's done. And then the flowers come and they bloom way more than if they were not pruned. And if you go along without pruning them, the bush becomes unfruitful. If God doesn't afflict us and bring these, we're going to choke. Uh, the flesh is going to overgrow our hearts and we're going to die. That worst affliction is not to be afflicted at all. And so this jumped out at me as I was reading Hudson Taylor is every gospel advance that he had was followed up with a severe and great trial. Every one of them came this massive pruning. And they weren't small ones. 
One, he said, was burying his dear little Gracie, who was eight years old, that died because of the conditions in China. His wife, whom he loved so dearly, died. Two other children and his second wife. Riots were breaking out, and the, the, church, the, the missionaries were having to leave all the work that was going on. They had to go out of town. He was being falsely accused as, as causing the riots. And I just think we get this all wrong how God gets fruit in our lives, and we wonder, why me, God, when he's pruning? And I just want you to understand, this is the path to glory. The Father's going to prune your branches, not to destroy you, but so that you will bear more fruit. So I'm the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. And I'll tell you this, that part of the pruning is showing you that you're not abiding in the true vine. So he, he, he prunes your false vines and he's going to prune the things that you're trying to abide in and look for hope and love and acceptance in and God and his goodness. He's going to prune it. Verse three, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. You're, you're saved. You're already justified. You're washed, disciples. And verse four, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So this is the, the key to the Christian life, or what Hudson would call his spiritual secret. Abide in me, and I in you. And so here's an important application. We come to Jesus to be saved. We come to Jesus for what we call justification, where God declares us righteous, forgiven, saved, joined. And then too often now we leave him at the door and we go live the Christian life now in our own strength and effort. As a pastor, I almost watch this again and again and again. You know, thank you, Jesus, for salvation. I love you so much, I'm going to go live my life for you, see you in heaven. And you go off and the rest of your life is just failing and despair and discouragement, what, kind of what Hudson was describing. And so we, we struggle and, and, and we say, remember your justification and then go live in your own strength. And it's why we're not bearing the kind of fruit that God desires here in John 15. And as a pastor, some of the Trials, they're just getting deeper and deeper. And you sit here and you've been through divorce and there's nothing more painful than being in a one flesh relationship and having it torn apart. There are health trials that are unbelievable and the financial struggles that go with that and the effects on marriage and relationships is endless. Depression that's debilitating, the holidays are approaching and there's going to be loved ones who are not going to be sitting at your table. I, I had someone say that every year it gets easier and I, I miss my dad more than ever. Maybe a mentor's let you down and elders let you down, a spouse let you down, a friend. I'm just depressed and I don't want to go on and I want you to hear this. You can get through anything I read that wrong. You can't get through anything by leaving at the, Jesus at the door of your justification. You can't get through life. And too many in the church are doing that. And I just want you to hear this. I've spent my whole life lifting up justification in all of its fullness. It's, it's a lost message, and we need to keep declaring that the one who believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. But you can't bear any fruit Without it, you have to be justified or you'll never bear fruit. You've got to come to Christ and believe and repent and be joined to the branch. But the way you are going to get through all of these trials and everything that's going to come into your life is by abiding in him, drawing from Christ and his sufficiency for whatever you are facing. There, there's some of you who are blossoming in trials and some who are drying up as branches because one is drawn from Christ and the other's drawn from, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps and get through this. You can't do it. That's what the pruning is for. 
to break you and show you that you come to the vine and you fall on him and say, apart from you, Jesus, I can do nothing. I can't handle this trial. I can't have overcoming power. I need thee every hour. Be my comfort, my hope, and my health, my help, and my strength, Lord Jesus. Everything you need for life and godliness is found in this true vine. Everything that you need comes out of Christ. You, you, you just, you need him. It's there right now for you, believer, this morning. Your strength and your vine can't get you through this. That's why you're being pruned. Oh, what God has given to us. I want to shout it from the rooftops. You have Christ in a union and relationship that nothing can separate you from it. You're joined to Jesus Christ. And you have a Father who's perfectly pruning you in all the right places so that you might bear more fruit. So every time I hear, why am I going through this trial? Because the Father loves you. And he's pruning you so that you will bear more fruit and you'll comfort those with the comfort that you're receiving in your afflictions. And this is dangerous to say because it could be misunderstood. But you cannot live the Christian life just because you're justified. You have to live into what that salvation purchased for you. And what that justification did was bring a vital union with Christ. And that is the only way that this life can be lived and bear fruit for his name's sake. Abide in me. You, you, you can't bear fruit without abiding. God's design is that you live in it and through Jesus Christ. And so, guys, this is what I've been wrestling with for 36 years, and I hope some of you are asking this question how do I do this? I love this. How do I do this? I want that kind of fruit. So for 35 years, <laughs> after reading this book, and, and the first, one of the first series I heard on the radio as a new believer was John MacArthur was preaching on John 15, abiding and bearing fruit. And I'm taking all this in, and I'm just celebrating and rejoicing. And these little beams are breaking in, and I've, I've had some sweet seasons in this but I've also uh, some major breakthroughs in the gospel. But I want the fullness of what God has designed for me in this relationship with Jesus Christ. I love the beams, but I want the, the, noon, the noonday sun. I want the fruit that Jesus is talking about in this chapter. Go to John 15, 16. What does he say? He says, you did not choose me, apostles, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. And that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask, the Father in my name may give to you. So this is fruit that will remain. It's the real abiding, lasting fruit. The kind that remains with time and drought and famine and trials and hardships and disappointments and tragedies and anything that comes into your life. It's, it's like that tree in Psalm 1 that bears fruit. So this is what I want in my own life is not fruit that is dependent on circumstances and how I feel. I'm going to call that waxed fruit. And it's just, things are good, God's good. Things are bad, this, woe is me, I just want to die. And we just, everything is based on circumstances and how you feel. And he's saying, I want to give you real, lasting, abiding fruit. I want this fruit so badly that I find myself hungry and thirsting for it, one night when I was on vacation, God was working so deep. I literally was just panting. I want this righteousness. And I thought, what would happen if everyone in this church got this? Because I know one man that God used to change China because of it. And, and I, heard, I heard one man, hurt, hurt, finally got to hear Hudson Taylor preach, and he said, I was so unimpressed. He, he wasn't a good speaker he was so small and frail and skinny. And then he started praying, and I felt like I was in the presence of God and began weeping. And, and one man said, Hudson, are you tempted to have a little bit of pride because God is using you more than any person on the face of the earth? And he said, on the contrary, God has finally found someone weak enough who will only depend completely on him. 
That's what he's looking for. That's what he's looking for. And I, all I could think of is if we got that, we wouldn't just change China, we would change the whole world. Verse 5 says he bears much fruit if he abides. Anyone see why this is so beautiful? It doesn't say that he might bear fruit, but he will. It's a promise. It's a guaranteed product. Abide in Jesus Christ and you're going to bear much fruit. You have the best vine, the true vine, and the best vine dresser, the Father. And as you abide in Christ, you'll bear fruit. Beautiful, God-honoring, lasting fruit. And I can't even tell you what this has done to my life in the last five weeks. The only block to fruit is my own self-sufficiency in sin and unbelief. The just shall live by faith in what? Who Christ, the Father, and the Spirit are to us, what the gospel has done for us. So union with Christ, favor with the Father, and the Spirit communicating the beauty and sufficiency of the vine. So the Christian life is I have Jesus Christ and a personal relationship with me 24-7, all day, every day. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and he dries up. And they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they're burned. This is tough. A life of deadness and dullness without any fruit is no relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't say how much fruit, but I just want you to see a fruitless life will dry up and be a dead, dry branch that will be gathered up and cast into hell on the last day. Let that awaken you this morning if you're a dead dog. Don't sit there and just say, are the Broncos playing? No, they have a bye week. It's a dead, dry, external religion. Don't sit outside when the king invites you to his table and to sup and to have fellowship with him. Some of you have gotten as close as creeds, confessions, baptism, the Lord's table, service, but you haven't come all the way to Jesus Christ. And he's saying, come to me. Come all the way. Don't stop short of a vital union relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't care if you got 30 years of religion under your belt. This morning, if you're a dead, dry branch, come to Jesus. Don't settle for religion. He offers himself. Come by faith, and, and you'll be joined by the Holy Spirit in a vital one union with me. Come. Pray if you need Jesus Christ this morning that you would come to Christ. He offers you salvation from your sin this morning. And what that means for you, believer, is what you're hearing this morning is if you've drifted and you're in this dry place, or you've never really understood it, it's to repent and turn back to your first love, which is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Turn back, oh man. Oh Jesus, come back to him for your all and all. Abide in him. Repent of chasing other lovers. Return, but return to him in holy matrimony to never leave or forsake him. It's his spirit. Is his spirit working in you right now saying, I'm dead. I've just drifted. All those other vines you talked about are what I'm abiding in. Father's pruning you this morning by his word. And the question is, will you repent and abide in Jesus? If you won't, that dead branch is going to be gathered up on the last day and thrown into the lake that burns fire. So the believer, let the word of God work this morning and wake you up. This is not a call to work harder. It's not a call to go to church more and read your Bible more. It's to come to Christ and rest in this gospel and then abide in him. Don't leave him at the door. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. 
And you will labor more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. You're joined to the vine. Abide in it. Abide in it. Oh God, He gave me a great reset on my vacation with the vine. And I'm asking the same for anyone that needs it this morning. Ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you if you abide in him and his word. I'm asking that that would happen for you this morning. It's not the will of God for you to have Christ, uh, to, for you to have Christ as your all and all and abiding in him and his fullness and his love. This vine is available to every believer coming to him. And so let's dig in now and start the application. You ready? Oh my. So my question, my whole Christian life, I see the true vine. And the fullness is so beautiful. And the more I study from book to book to book, it just grows more and more as I study the scriptures. So as I stand here this morning, my problem is not the vine. I have so much faith in who he is. Overwhelming this vine. But when I look at my little branches, and I want to know how do I get that sufficiency from Christ that is eternal and abundant and omnipotent to flow into my life and get the fruit that this passage is talking about. I want that abundant fruit that abides. And then God gets all the glory. Can't be me. It's got to be in a way that he is the one who's praised. And so what is being offered to me by Jesus on the night in which he's going to be betrayed to accomplish salvation in the upper room is so rich and amazing. There's true fruit that you can have Christ-like behavior. My Savior tells me in the intimacy of that night, abide in me. And you're going to bear much fruit. Do not leave me at the door of justification. You, you're, don't leave Christ. How do, we, how do we be Christians and be Christless? I am yours and you are mine. Stay in me. Stay in my love. Stay in my sufficiency. Abide in it. Don't, don't go away from it. It's your only hope to bear fruit. Apart from him, you can do nothing. So what I want to do is try to flush out what that means to abide in him of what he's been showing me this last month. First, stay in my justification. And I battled this so deep my first 20 years as a believer, getting back under the law, getting under the, the works of the flesh to try to get acceptance. Have I done enough? I have battled this so much. And, and the answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to abide in him is to never be moved away that the only way I can ever be accepted is by the work of Jesus Christ and it's finished and I'm loved and I am his and he is mine. You got to abide in that. Rest in that. Believe it. Settle it. You can't abide if every day he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me. He lo you can't abide until you, you stay in that. So I start there that this Jesus I know him and I love him and he loves me because of his work alone. I, I live there. And then second, now with him as my, my Lord, I trust him for everything. And I mean everything. He's a present Christ and Americans are so self-sufficient. We just try to solve everything and look to our own strength. And he's trying to say, abide in me. I will take care of you. I'll feed you. I'll protect you. I'll help you. He, he wants you to trust him for everything, not after you try everything in your own strength and say, I can't do anything. Okay, Jesus, help me. To abide in him is to look to him for everything, not just justification. I trust you with everything in my life. When I abide in you, I get your power. That's what grace is. I draw on your power now to go do this abundant fruit that I can't do. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Do you realize the power that abiding in Jesus Christ, you can do works that you could never have hoped or dreamed of? So by abiding in him, I don't even need to discuss how much does my life have to be changed, all of this. It changes. You can abide in Christ and draw power. 
power from Christ to go live like Christ. And when you don't abide and you try to go live this Christian life in your own life, you will despair, you'll be broken, you'll be sad, you will not get there. Finances. I can trust you with my finances. Some of you, your vine is your finances and you live in it by the stock market. What goes up? What are the forecasts? It owns you. And Hudson Taylor is sitting in the middle of China Inland Mission, no way to get money. And his wife says, how much money do we have? And he smiles because he's abiding in the vine. And he says, 25 cents and all the promises of God. He believed. He abided. And he trusts God to be sufficient in his finances. Contentment. A good shepherd, I can lie down in green pastures because he's my shepherd. He can be a very present help in the time of trouble. Holiness, I have tried. If you could get holy by your own strength, I can't tell you how hard I've tried. And I've tried. And it comes by abiding. From him, you get the expulsive power of a new affection. Temptations lose their power when thou art near. And so there's a way to to be made holy by abiding in the vine. From him. Repentance. Thomas Watson said, How good it would be if we were more deeply affected and moved to tears by our sin. Jesus and John said, you you can't continue in sin if you abide in him. And while I'm abiding in him, I can't sin. Abide in him. Draw. The the repentance when you do sin is so deep because you love him. He's your life. So repentance comes quicker and faster. All of your healing from your past hurts present hurts and future hurts, so many that abiding in him, he can begin to heal all these things. Assurance. As you abide in him, fruit starts coming up on your vines and full assurance starts popping up. Evangelism, it's just exploding. When you abide in him, You just want to tell others about him. When you're walking with him all day, just, I I am in him and he's in me and I'm abiding in it. You just just want to tell. You just want to speak. It's just evangelism will just flow out of your heart and your life. Love your wife. As I abide in Christ, who better knows how to love his bride. I enjoy the love of Christ every day, how he loves me. And in that, as I abide, I'm going to be able to love my bride in a whole new way. Singleness, he was. Abide, he can give you peace and joy and abundant fruit in this season. Death, You can stare in the eyes of the risen Christ who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. Death loses its sting and fear when I abide in Christ. My daily needs. Hudson Taylor never asked for a penny. At the end of his life, $10 million came in a year for the mission. Never asked for a penny. And one of the main contributors, George Mueller. Beautiful. I love what he said. He said, if you abide in Christ, his will becomes your will. You know what that could do to you? Most of our fights are trying to get his will to be our will. And if you abide in Christ, you, you love him. You love his will. And anything that he brings into your life is his will. And you begin to receive it. And so I just, I fight so much with my will and his will. Abide in him. And his will will become your will. It'll become, you'll start being changed as you abide in Christ and his will, my will. Do you see this? I could give you 70 more. I didn't sleep much. I think my favorite quote from Hudson 
As he, as, as he said, if, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And I've been running with that for years and preaching it and spending my whole life trying to, have I given him everything? Have I given him everything? If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And this time as I'm reading the book, it finally breaks open. What he means is if you abide in Christ, you get everything. And so is he Lord of trusting him with your finances? Is he Lord of trusting him with your health? Is he Lord of trusting him with whatever his will is for you today? And so it, it, it's, it, is he not Lord of all? I, I've been justified and I can trust Jesus now for everything. Lord, you are Lord of everything. I'm done carrying all the burdens of the world on my shoulder saying, I trust you. And if you abide in him, he can be Lord of all. Everything. Give it to him. Abide trust him. Oh, the fruit that could come. So here's what I want you to get. I'm going way too long. I knew I was going to be in trouble. Um, I'm just going to move quick. Hudson Taylor, converted in his teens, radical, gets a call to China. It's placed on his heart. He begins preparing for it through medical training, the word, prayer. He's practicing deep trust. He's, he's living on as little as he can. He's eating rice He's ministering and so many beautiful stories of how God's equipping him. He goes to China in his late 30s. I think it was about 12 years he's already serving in China. So this is someone who's really living a faithful life. And, he, and he, they give him the China Inland Mission. And so now he's got to oversee others. And these pressures are starting to come on him. And he shared that he, he, as he worked so hard at holiness... He found himself coming so short and even struggled at times to believe he was a Christian because he was so sinful. And so here's this holy godly man just battling sin and feeling like, can I even be a Christian with all this sin? Anybody ever think that? He knew that God had done a work in his heart. His love for him and desire to serve him, he, he couldn't deny it. So he concluded that this must be the Christian life to grind it out and get to heaven and finally have this life that he wanted to live for God. He said he was always tired, weary, staying up late, doing work, easily irritated. He said this, this, this life of fighting for holiness is better than not fighting for holiness at all. But he said it broke in on him one day. And he realized it was to be found in Christ by abiding. And he said that in that relationship, Christ was for him and present and working through him. It wasn't his own strength, but it was Christ's. And he read a book that kind of started the, the revolution in his mind. And the first is that the Lord Jesus received as holiness begun. So when you receive Christ, holiness begins. And he says, the Lord Jesus cherished is holiness advancing. So as we grow in our faith, Christ is cherished more and more. And he says, the Lord Jesus counted upon as never absent would be holiness complete to trust him fully. So what he's saying is when, when you finally realize that you can trust Christ for everything. He's present. He's there for you. You don't have to do all these in your own strength is when holiness is really going. He found everything in Christ that the key to getting all that he needed to bear fruit for God in China and in his own life was by faith, was living by faith. The just shall live by faith, living into all that Jesus was to him and all of his sufficiency. At the end of his life, there was like 2,000 missionaries now in the inland of China with $10 million a year being given by prayer. And it was said of him that he was at such peace and joy after this moment, resting in Jesus as he served in his power and his presence. They said it never went back to the old way of grinding in his own strength and full of fear. He was resting and trusting in the always near and present Christ to live by faith and to trust Christ for everything and to take all these burdens off our American shoulders of trying to be sufficient in yourself. Do you see what he offers to the child of God? We have learned to trust in our own doings and sufficiency, but those who trust him fully find him fully true, says the him. Come live into Christ with me. He's sufficient for everything that you're facing and everything that he's calling you to do this morning, you serve a sufficient Christ. You're joined to him as a vine and a branch. So the key, he said, is faith. Abide in him. 
believe the gospel, believe what he is and promises to be for you, a present Christ. Hudson said, I have only gotten to the edge of a boundless sea. I've sipped only of that which fully satisfies. It's so bountiful, the fullness of Christ. So how do we increase our faith? He said, by thinking of all that Jesus is, all that he is for us, his life, his death, his work, it's all revealed in his word to be the subject of our constant thoughts. Not striving to have faith, but a looking to the faithful one seems all that we need. A resting in the loved one entirely for time and eternity. To God be the glory. St. Patrick said, Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. We have Christ. Abide in him by faith and you'll bear much fruit. Let all these burdens fall off of you trying to be Christ. And he bids you to come and abide. And in that, the fruit And that man never went back to that angry, striving, frustrated man. He just walked in peace. And the things that came at him were so unbelievable. And that peace could never be shaken. And people would be like, don't you care about the war that's going on? And he said, yes, but Jesus cares. And he said, isn't that better than me being all fretted? And he just learned how to trust him in everything. That's what he's inviting us into. So let's pray, and I've had a song on my heart all month that we're going to listen to as we pass out the elements. So I'll pray, and then the ushers will come and begin passing out the elements. This is an ordinance to remember everything I just shared. Um, Only believers, so if you're an unbeliever, withhold, and let's talk afterwards about how to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I come before you, and I thank you for this amazing word that Jesus gave us that night in the upper room. I thank you that it's as simple as abide in me, the true vine. And from him, we can draw everything for life and godliness. I thank you, Lord, that it's, it's not um, we get saved and now we go live in our sufficiency, but you've made us dependent to draw all the power that we need of grace through a person through us remaining and staying and believing and abiding in Jesus Christ and we'll bear much fruit. And yes, there's battle and fight to get into the means of grace, to lead us to the vine. God, let us fight to get in the word, to read from cover to cover. Everything in this book points us back to abiding in the vine. And so I pray, Lord, let us, let us be a people that fight to rest in the Lord Jesus Christ and let him be everything for us. God, do more for us than we could ever hope or think in Jesus Christ. Amen.